Um, so uh, today at the joint seminar, we're uh, pleased to have Jan Peshek um, from University of Warsaw. Um, he's going to talk to us today about uh, heterogeneous gradient flows with applications to collective dynamics. Um, thanks, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for giving me opportunity to present uh, some of my results, uh, which are uh, a part of joint work with uh, David Poyato from the University of Granada. I'm going to talk about heterogeneous gradient flows with applications to collective dynamics, but I'm not going to focus on the applications, actually. I, there is part of applications that have to be mentioned because uh, they are sort of, sort of the origin of the whole of the whole project. In a way, we started with a very specific problem from collective dynamics. And we were thinking that we can solve one of the solve this problem, which has been open for a couple of years now. And uh, while doing so, we ended up developing something that we, think, we thought that is much more general. And in a way, it started to be truly the uh, maybe the main uh, scope of our work. Um, OK, <clears throat> so the first part, let me briefly uh, recall some notions. So the first one is uh, just uh, continuity equation. But uh, maybe one thing that we should remember is that the, this concept of continuity equation is in the sense of, um, well, this is a measure valued uh, solution, right? So mu is a measure, I usually write it like this. So it, this is a family of probability measures, or otherwise we can understand it as a curve in the space of probability measures. And U is a vector field that is specific for uh, the solution mu. So usually it comes with some other uh, PDE, uh, such as, as we have usually in, uh, in fluid mechanics, for instance. But generally, let it look. Uh, as follows. And then what I refer to as heterogeneous continuity, continuity equation is presented here. Uh, so you will notice that, first of all, what changed is that a parameter omega appeared. And this parameter throughout the talk will be uh, inside the space Rd2. And x is in the space Rd1. So D1 is the dimension of X, D2 dimension of omega. And here, X, so no, the divergence is taken with respect only to X, which sort of uh, can be understood that the motion actually is uh, taking place only in the X variable and omega is, is really a parameter which uh, controls sort of the species or um, or some other properties of uh, the ensemble. And this can be, in some sense, uh, rewritten as a set of continuity equations, which are indexed with omega. Uh, so uh, in some sense, this is an omega parameterized family of continuity equations. Uh, so parameters now are omega and t. And one very important issue that uh, we have to get out of the way at the very beginning is that is this bottom equation. <clears throat> um, so let me explain. So I wanted to draw a picture, but unfortunately I have a malfunction of my um, pen. So drawing with a mouse is not a good idea. So let me just explain here. The idea is that if you have, sir, say, a container in which there is some um, ensembles of particles, of different kinds of particles, and for, for instance, two kinds. One kind of particles is affected by certain forces. The other kind is affected by other forces. So if there was no interaction between 
the two species of particles, then we could decouple the continuity equations and then we would be on this in this situation here on the right hand side. So the u, the velocity u, depends only on the mu omega for this fixed omega that we are interested in. But this is not what we are interested in. The, um, <clears throat> this results make sense. I mean, it is interesting only if we make sure that the velocity field for each fiber, so I will call this omega, so, so this uh, mu omega as fiber of the entire bundle mu. So the behavior of each fiber depends on the whole uh, mu, which is essential. So physically, we can think about it as these two ensembles in one container, but they also collide with each other or somehow interact with each other. And we cannot uh, understand the motion of one without understanding the uh, behavior of the whole in a way. Okay, so this is not a decoupled problem, of course, otherwise it would be boring or done actually. Okay, so it was supposed to be a picture here drawn in the real time, but not anymore. And let, let me jump to gradient, gradient flows and continuity equation. I mean, the relation between gradient flows and continuity equation. So let's begin very simple with a classical notion of a gradient flow, wherein some position, say x, uh, changes in time according to such a, uh, ordinary differential equations. So x, the mapping from t to x is a curve in Rd, and this position x evolves in the opposite direction of the gradient of E. So in a sort of attempt to minimize uh, the energy. Whether it succeeds to minimize energy is, of course, uh, it's, not, it's not unsure, but sometimes it can, sometimes it doesn't. So this is the classical notion. Then there is the Hilbert uh, notion of a gradient flow by Brezis and Pazzi. And this is something that essentially you teach at your usual, maybe a little bit advanced PDE course. So this time, instead of an equation, you have an inclusion, you have a concept of uh, a subdifferential. So it works with the functionals that are not necessarily regular in the sense that they are differentiable, but they are convex. And here I snuck in uh, this quantity here, this lambda over two x minus y squared. So this is something that is related to the idea of lambda convexity, which is either a stronger or weaker, depending on the sign of lambda notion than uh, convexity. So lambda convexity related to this type of subdifferential, And this lambda controls the rate, the exponent uh, uh, in the decay of the distance between your solution and the equilibrium, say. Okay, let's go farther. <clears throat> then this whole idea can be further generalized. And this is something that I maybe uh, a little bit, bit jokingly uh, refer to as equivalent generalization. And the idea is that instead of the previous one, the previous notion, we can look at this inequality. This is called the evolutionary variational inequality. And on Hilbert spaces, this is equivalent to the inclusion into the subdifferential. But the great advantage of this, of looking at this problem, uh, as we see here, is that there is no inner product here, as you can see, which means that this idea can be directly transported to more general settings such as uh, Polish space setting. And this has been done. So there is a notion of gradient flow in Polish spaces. We have EVI, evolutionary variational inequality, but no subdifferential. And then 
uh, there is the weakly Riemannian structure of the specific Polish space, which is P2W2. So the space is as follows. P2 is the space of probability measures with finite second moment. The distance is the Wasserstein distance W2. Let me recall it just in case. Uh, W2 squared is the infimum over gammas of such an expression. So this is the cost function X minus X prime squared integrated with, with respect to what we call uh, transportation plans. So gammas are all probability measures with X marginal equal to mu and X prime marginal equal to mu. And it can be shown that uh, this problem actually admits a minimum, which we will call an optimal transportation plan. <clears throat> And um, based on Otto's work from 2001, so Felix Otto's, uh, the Wasserstein space P2W2 has a weakly Riemannian structure, meaning that locally at any measure, so here this X is a measure in P2, at any measure locally we have a, a tangent space which is isomorphic to L2 with respect to the measure X. And if we have a proper tangent space, which is a Hilbert space, then we can reintroduce a notion of, um, <clears throat> of a subdifferential. I'm not going to present you the definition right now of the subdifferential. I'm going to, with respect to the W2 uh, topology, I'm going to then present sort of our variant of the subdifferential later on. Okay, so again, we sort of reintroduce the subdifferential formulation to gradient flows on the Polish space, which happens to also be a Riemannian manifold, which is the P2W2 uh, space. Then there is this whole, um, correspondence between gradient flows and continuity equation, which roughly can be stated as follows. If we have an absolutely continuous curve P2 in P2W2, satisfying the evolutionary variational inequality, then such a curve is equivalent to a distributional solution to this problem. So we have a continuity equation and here U, which is sort of can be treated as mu with a dot, uh, as previously we wrote, this velocity u belongs to the minus subdifferential of e at mu, at least for almost all t. <clears throat> and, uh, and the general result that one can expect is uh, uh, as follows. If we take a functional that is proper, coercive, lower semi-continuous, lambda convex along generalized geodesics, I'm going to go back to this concept. If you don't recall, if you don't have, uh, out of the top of your mind, the notion of lambda convexity along generalized geodesic inquiry, I will sort of reintroduce it later. Uh, then there exists a unique gradient flow issued at any mu zero, which is belongs to the domain of E, and it satisfies the continuity equation uh, in the sense of distributions. And from this, based on this lambda convexity, we can also have a stability estimate uh, essentially automatically. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Next, before uh, I finally uh, will present some of our results, let's just, let, let us just uh, go through the basic applications. Maybe the most, uh, the funnest in a way application is if we assume that mu, our measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, and we take the entropy functional and we take the subdifferential uh, at G, since E is regular enough, the subdifferential has one element only. So actually U is equal to minus gradient of G divided by G. We plug it into the continuity equation and we obtain the heat equation. Further, Many more models can be described using gradient flows. These are Fokker-Planck, Vlasov, 
also keller zegel uh, model for chemotaxis, and many models of first-order collective dynamics. So here we can think about any sort of voice of type interactions with the gravitational potential or Coulomb, for instance, or I don't know, Hexelman Krause model of opinion dynamics. <clears throat> okay, now let's go back to the heterogeneous continuity equation. So, this is the slide that you almost in this form have already seen, but now we sort of introduce another space that is. Uh, embedded in the space of the probability measures. I'm going to define it very soon. And I'm go and also we we understand that our new specific velocity is precisely new specific in this sense. Uh, here I just mentioned that we can also you look at this continuity equation as a proper continuity equation in both variables as long as we assume that the velocity is zero in the direction of omega. What is this space P2 mu? In order to define it, let's recall the disintegration theorem, which is the main tool uh, to define it. And let us also make sure that we remember that mu is a prescribed marginal throughout the, this whole talk mu belongs to PRD2 and it controls the omega marginal of mu. So this is the distributions of the parameter omega, which stays fixed because it doesn't change in our uh, continuity equation. So then any mu acting on phi, on any phi which is say Borel measurable function here, this is a shorthand notation for just integral of phi with respect to d mu. It can be decomposed in this form. And here, mu omega is a family of vector, uh, no, not vector, family of probability measures, which are um, sort of narrowly Borel measurable with respect to the measure mu. And this thing, mu omega, I will call the fibers. So mu omega are fibers of mu, and mu is the uh, distribution of, uh, of the fibers. Uh, <clears throat> and to, there is also a short hand notation uh, as here. Of course, this is not a product measure, not necessarily. And maybe let, let me also make another comment that uh, disintegration theorem can be also viewed as a sort of variant of um, conditional probability. Okay, so our space P2 nu is the space of all measures that have the omega marginal equal to nu. So there are sort of admissible in our motion that doesn't change uh, omega. And second moments with respect to x are finite. And our topology is, okay, I disintegrate mu and sigma. I plug in all the fibers inside um, classical Wasserstein uh, two distance. And then I reintegrate it with respect to d mu. Uh, pretty simple, but you can look at, uh, we'll soon look at this whole idea from different perspectives. And let me just very briefly go through all steps that need to be done in order for all of this process to come to a positive end. But we are not going to go very deeply into that because Essentially, the bottom line is as follows. You take the book by Ambrosio, Gigli, and Savare. You use what you can, and you generalize what you must. And this is what you would expect to work. 
but there are some problems which I will describe later. So first, we prove that the fibered Wasserstein space is a Polish space, and then we sort of can use the general theory to get the gradient flow in the sense of EVI. Second, we prove that it's actually a Riemannian manifold, so we can use Otto's approach. We can uh, develop a fibered subdifferential calculus and uh, finally prove equivalence between absolutely continuous curves, satisfying the EVI and uh, <clears throat> with our heterogeneous continuity equation. And the sort of end result is pretty much what we would expect. Everything that should work, works. And uh, so there are some assumptions on, on E that I'm not going to disclose here that are sort of maybe more delicate in the sense of how E is related to omega. But in principle, it works. Uh, so we take E that is proper coercive lower semi-continuous and lambda convex on G fiber generalized geodesics. And we get the continuity equation. So there, there is a unique gradient flow which solves the continuity equation. And uh, maybe <clears throat> for reference, I will uh, let us have a short glance at uh, our notion of fiber fresher subdifferential. Um, essentially for our fixed marginal mu and any functional e. Uh, and any u that is in the tangent space to the uh, our fiber space, so the, this L mu 2 is the tangent space at mu. Uh, what we, how we define it, when you look at this here, here let's just say that gamma here belongs to gamma O mu, which is which are the optimal plans uh, for the fiber. Um, or the fibered uh, Wasserstein distance, it resembles the Hilbert uh, setting uh, quite a bit. And uh, maybe let's move also to the notion of convexity along generalized geodesics. And here, let's not maybe look into it too much. Let's just say that the idea is as follows. So our space is a Riemannian manifold. And as Riemannian manifolds do, it can also have a curvature. If it has a curvature, then we have to be careful about uh, convexity. So we have to uh, sort of keep in mind that instead of, um, I mean, we have to um, use con convexity, which is along geodesics. And generalized geodesics is a concept that is related to geodesics. And the gist of the idea is that instead of taking a geodesics um, that sort of starts from one point and that connects two points, we have a geodesic that starts again from one point and it connects to another, but it is sort of seen in the frame of reference of some other fixed uh, point. So here you have the basis the base measure mu star, which serves, serves as this reference point for the geodesics. And uh, also let me uh, emphasize that we still have this lambda here. So, so this is lambda convexity. Okay. And the generic applications are what you, you would expect. So everything that we said about applications for the classical gradient flows it uh, sort of works as adding uh, multi species, multiple species to, to those problems. So we have Fokker Planck with uh, various particles responding differently to the drag force and the random motion. We have Vlasov with uh, different types of plasma, multi species, first order collective dynamics, 
for me, one that is interesting and uh, related to our gener our original problem is Kuramoto model with various natural frequencies. And for instance, also the multi-species color Zagel model. Okay, now, what is, so instead of going through, I don't know, the whole general idea of how to uh, build this uh, concept, because it's, I mean, it's pretty large, and at, at the same time, not every problem here is interesting. Let me show you the one problem that was surprisingly, in a way, the most difficult for us uh, to solve. And in many ways, we failed actually to solve it. We sort of replaced it with something else. And before I say it, before I tell you about this uh, problem, let me tell you about the two most sort of obvious approaches to the whole issue. So you can look at the fibered Wasserstein distance instead of like this from two different perspectives in a way. So the first one is what I call the top-down approach where we just write it as an optimal uh, transportation problem with a very specific cost function. So here, gamma actually depends on x, x prime, omega, and omega prime. And we as when we and we use the following test function. So this is x minus x prime squared, which is sort of responsible for having here this classical Wasserstein distance. But we also add plus infinity whenever omega is not equal to omega prime. So this is a cost function that acts along the fibers, along the omega fibers, it acts as a Wasserstein cost function. And if you want to cross the fibers, then uh, it penalizes uh, the, I mean, such an action is penalized with infinite cost. So generally speaking, the idea is to treat the fiber distance as a standard optimal transport problem with discontinuous and infinitely valued cost functions. So th this is obviously discontinuous and obviously also infinitely valued as at least for some arguments. And the problem is why this is, so it sometimes is a good way to look at the problem, but one of the most important uh, issues uh, is that the fundamental theorem of optimal transport fails in some sense for such cost functions. Uh, so generally speaking, fundamental theorem of optimal transport works if your cost function is either continuous or it has only finite values. And what the optimal, the fundamental theorem of optimal transport says, okay, so I have a question mark here. I'm going to go back to why it is here, but the fundamental theorem of optimal transport says, among other things, that any plan omega is, so this is gamma, not omega, any plan gamma is optimal, cyclically monotone with respect to the cost function. So if we call the cost function just C, the generic cost function, the cyclic monotonicity is defined as follows. A is supposed to be cyclically monotone. If this sort of easy to, to understand algebraic pointwise property is satisfied. And this is very useful characterization. And if your cost function happens to be discontinuous and happens to be infinitely valued, then there is a generalized notion of cyclic uh, monotonicity, which is not as nice and it didn't work uh, for us. So in a way, even though there is a, 
a variant of fundamental theorem of optimal transport in such a situation, it wasn't good of, for us. And the other approach is the bottom-up approach. So fiber to optimal transport, we can prove it, and we, we actually prove it, that they can be decomposed or disintegrated as follows. So if gamma is, a, is supposed to be an optimal plan, uh, transportation plan for the fiber transportation, then it is always on, of such a form where the x and x prime marginal, or I mean not the marginal, but the, the fiber bundle is uh, then disintegrated with respect to the marginal here, which says the following. Well, of course, it has to be new for omega, but for omega prime is we just take the Dirac delta, which means that we force omega prime to be omega always. And gamma omegas are optimal in the classical WT distance. So the fiber optimal plan is sort of what we would expect uh, to be. And this is a very good idea in most situations. So the idea is to construct everything fiber by fiber using gamma omega and then reintegrating them sort of by inverting the disintegration theorem. And there are two problems with this approach. Uh, one, the easier one I actually wrote here and the, the more difficult is something that I remembered later. So the easier one is that reversing the disintegration theorem requires you to ensure the new measurability of the function omega, which maps omega into gamma omega as a function from RD2 into uh, measures, uh, uh, th this should be 2D1 because we have X and X prime with uh, weak topology. And let me recall the disintegration theorem. The point is that if in order to dis define mu as a functional on phi, say for phi, which is say bounded continuous function, we have to make sure that this is an integrable, uh, this as a function of omega is integrable with respect to mu. So at least we need measurability. So this is something that we usually solve using some uh, measurable selection theorem, such as um, there is this um, kuratowski rynardzewski theorem. Uh, this is one we use. And, um, oh, sorry, it should be here. But there is also another problem. And the other problem is that you cannot fully recover the dynamics from fiber-wise dynamics, because as we mentioned at the very beginning, the velocity depends on the whole bundle. Uh, meaning that it is not usually not sufficient to do everything. Uh, some parts can be done by gluing fibers, but we have to sort sort of understand that it uh, it doesn't work uh, all the time. And now the problem, very easy problem, very classically easy problem, where both of these approaches seemingly fail. By seemingly, I mean, we couldn't do it using uh, any of these approaches. And this is stability of optimality. So if mu n converges to mu, sigma n converges to sigma narrowly, meaning that tested by bounded continuous functions, gamma n is an optimal plan between mu n and sigma n, then up to a subsequence, gamma n is supposed to converge narrowly and any of the limits of gamma n should be an optimal plan between mu and sigma. Something that sounds quite uh, intuitive. However, the standard proof, and I would say the only proof we could find actually uh, of the 
stability of optimality uses the fundamental theorem of optimal transport, which immediately throws the top-down approach out of the window because the fundamental, as I said, the fundamental theorem of optimal transport fails in this situation. Specifically, the uh, cyclical monotonicity fails. Okay, so maybe the bottom-up approach is better. And it's not really. So let's make the assumptions even stronger. Okay, so instead of narrow convergence of the measures, let's say that for all omegas, we have narrow convergence on each uh, fiber. You can easily show that it, this is something that implies narrow convergence of uh, mu n to mu n sigma n to sigma. And well, from that we can infer that for all omega, the sequence of optimal plans between the fibers uh, converges up to a subsequence. This is sort of from the classical stability of optimality. And the limit, any limit is optimal in the classical Wasserstein W2 sense. But the problem is, well, let me read it again or say it again. For each omega, we have a subsequence. What we really need, of course, is a subsequence that works for almost all omega. And uh, we just don't know how to, uh, how to do it. It seems impossible, maybe. And so the conjecture is, our conjecture is that the key point is to actually find a proper alternative to the narrow convergence. Because the narrow convergence, it doesn't see the fiber structure at all. This, this is why we try this convergence uh, for all fibers, because this stuff, it sees the um, this fiber structure much better, but still it didn't work. So you may ask, okay, so if it did, didn't work, then did we actually fail to do what we wanted, and I will just say that, sorry, the result I'm going to talk about is actually false. No, no, no. So actually, we proved something that is weaker, but is still sufficient. So this is a solution, a, an easy solution to a, diffi to a difficult problem in some sense, uh, but it doesn't solve the whole problem, but it's good enough for us in the meantime, at least. So this is something that here I will call strong stability of optimality. And the difference is in the assumption that we just, instead of taking narrow convergence here and here, we take the strong convergence in W2 mu. So in the, in the fiber Wasserstein distance. <coughs> and then we take an optimal plan between mu and uh, sigma n, and then it converges narrowly. So we lose uh, strength in this convergence from W to new to narrow convergence, and the limits are optimal between mu and sigma. And for reasons that I'm maybe going to explain a little bit at the very end, this is very not optimal notion of stability of optimality. This is too strong. This uh, convergence is too strong, but it works to build uh, uh, the sub-differential calculus. Uh, good, it's, so it's good enough for us. And let me show you uh, how this, I mean, it's difficult to, uh, to do an online uh, talk with the proper proofs, especially at uh, almost at 9 p.m. So let me show you a very easy proof of, uh, of this result. So first of all, we, for the sake of presentation, I'm going to assume that sigma n is just equal to sigma. So it converges because it's a constant. It's, uh, it, it's not, a, it doesn't make the problem easier. It just makes the presentation easier. So 
first I write that clearly gamma n converges to gamma uh, and this uh, here uh, is acronym right uh, so it's narrowly and I say it's clearly because it's standard procedure so what you do is you say okay if these guys converge that in this sense that it means that they also converge narrowly if they converge narrowly by Prohover of theorem it means that they are uniformly tight uniform tightness of mu and sigma uh, trans so the, they are the marginals of gamma they mean that gamma n is also uniformly tight which again by Prohorov theorem implies existence of a subsequence that converges narrowly so this is standard and then we use an argument that is related to the sort of gluing of plants gluing of optimal plants this is a argument that is usually used to prove that the Wasserstein distance satisfies uh, triangle inequality so we take a triple plan a triple plan just means that when we project it into the corresponding variables we obtain the corresponding marginals which are written here so mu n mu and sigma okay but we also assume that if we project it into the first and second one we get something that is optimal and also for the third for the second and third we also get optimal so you can think about it this way between mu and, mu and mu it is optimal between mu and sigma it is also optimal and thus we can't guarantee uh, we have no guarantee that it is optimal between mu and then sigma that's the whole point if it if we wanted it to be optimal between mu and then sigma it would be uh, essentially an overdetermined system this cannot be done so we define precisely this projection this is the push forward projection of alpha n uh, of uh, eta n onto mu n and sigma by alpha n so this is just some admissible plan which is not necessarily optimal as i said and then using the same argumentation as for, as for gamma n it converges up to a subsequence narrowly to an admissible plan between mu and sigma and then we do the proof by contradiction we suppose that our limit gamma is not optimal okay if it is not optimal of course this is uh, it is easy to show that it has to be an admissible plan between mu and sigma okay okay it is if it is not optimal then this has to be strictly smaller than this guy right because this is um this is the distance and this is the integration of the supposedly not optimal plan with respect to the cost function i remind you that it is an optimal plan so it is it doesn't i mean there is no motion in omegas so this is indeed the proper um rate way of writing uh, this distance or yeah supposedly this is larger than the distance and then we use the fact that gamma and converges narrowly to gamma and we use uh, well portmanteau theorem which says that then such an inequality holds this is the limit inferior i just uh, have to mention that this function is of course lower bounded and lower semi-continuous which is the uh, assumption necessary in portmanteau theorem <clears throat> okay so we have gamma n here but okay we assume that gamma n are uh, optimal between mu n and sigma and alpha n are comp competitors uh, for being optimal between mu n and sigma but not necessarily optimal so keeping the same inequality i can change gamma n for alpha n here maybe i increase it a little bit 
or even a lot. Okay, now take this guy, remove the limit inferior, just look at for each n. What we do is we add a phantom variable here. So in a sense, we can look at it this way. X is the variable that is related to mu n. X double prime is related to sigma and we add artificially in, a, in some sense, the variable that is related to the middle mu. Of course, this was a projection of eta n. So this is equal to precisely this. And then we use basic algebra. So we have squared of the first one, square of the second one, and the double the product between the two. Of course, integrated with respect to eta n. And when we sort of realize what each of these terms is, and we use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality here, we get the proper distances, which this converges to zero by our assumptions, this stays, and this also converges to zero. So eventually what happens is everything converges to something that it is supposed to be strictly larger than. And it is a contradiction with the fact, with the assumption that gamma is not optimal. So this is very easy. But as I said, it is not really um, what we would like to have. And uh, at the very end, let me show you the original problem that we are interested in and how it relates to, to this whole stuff. So suppose that we have a, uh, energy functional as follows. And you may think about it like, like this is some interaction part of the functional that takes the, uh, into the account the entire bundles mu and mu prime. I mean, this is mu and and mu and itself. Mu prime is also mu, but another instance of it. And then you have this part of energy that is um, where the fibered stuff sort, sort of plays the essential role. And it is very simple. This is the kernel W. The Since it is smooth, everything here is smooth, uh, you can actually calculate the fibered subdifferential in such a way that it consists only of, of this guy, which then necessarily minus this has to be the velocity for the uh, heterogeneous continuity equation. Okay, so this is what I would call a Kuramoto type uh, equation. And how it is related to Cooker's mail is that if you do the change of variables, so you change X back into X and omega into V, which is precisely this velocity here, then what you get is a kinetic formulation for the weakly singular Cooker's mail model with alpha between zero and one. Weakly singular means when you look at this guy, the second derivative here, d2w, has singularity of order minus alpha or of, or, or of order alpha. But it is a little bit different than Cooker's mail because, because this is mat mat matrix valued. So this is a little bit different, but it is still some semblance of solution to the problem, which I would say that is open since 2009, of um, well building some uh, or creating some idea of a solution of a solution for weakly singular Hooker's model for alpha that is larger or equal to one over two. And this incorpor incorporates also that, uh, uh, well, alpha greater than one over two. And uh, <clears throat> that's about it. But let me leave you with uh, some open problems. So the first open problem is uh, in a way, something obvious in the sense that it is obvious that it would be worthwhile to do it. Whether it's interesting, it's uh, it's not so clear. So do the whole 
this whole process, but for non-convex functionals. There is a theory for uh, gradient flows with non-convex functionals. It exploits the uh, so-called uh, JKO scheme. And one of the maybe greatest proponents of, these, uh, of this idea is uh, Filippo Sanandrogio, if I uh, understand correctly. Mm. This is, I would say, probably hell of a work to do. And the other two open problems, in my opinion, are maybe smaller, but are more interesting. So the first one is to propose a suitable modification of the narrow convergence for stability of optimality. So don't do what we did. Don't uh, do the easy stuff with some not really suited version of stability of optimality. Do the proper one. As of today, we weren't able to do it. I sort of suspect that maybe David is still working on it. Uh, and the second one is to recover the use the that type of convergence from the point two in order to recover the characterization of convergence in W2 as narrow convergence supplemented by convergence of second moments. So there is this characterization of W2 convergence. And we hope, it seems, that there should be similar type of <coughs> characterization of, con of fibered convergence uh, if we can uh, modify the narrow convergence properly. And here also the references to the two works that I talked about. The heterogeneous gradient flows are in the first one. <clears throat> and this things related to Kuramoto and Kuker Smail model, uh, they are in the second paper. And uh, this is it. Uh, thank you for the attention. And uh, yeah, that's all.